Leslie Greengard, founding director of the Simon Center for Data Analysis and professor of mathematics, Courant Institute of New York University. Modeling physical systems in complex geometry. All right, so thank you very much. Um, it's a, a delight to be here. Um, I visited the Conrad Tuda Center 20 years ago and I saw Christoph Schutter there. We were both younger um, at the time when Peter Dorfelhardt was the director. Uh, so it was announced that I had two jobs, and one of them, in the, in the words of Tony Hay, was a fourth paradigm job, and one is a third paradigm job. And I'm going to talk about the third paradigm, I'm sorry to say, which is a much more science-focused talk, and it's a talk about uh, the low-level ingredients that make computers do what they do when they solve large scientific applications. So there will be some equations, and then the only good news is that there won't be an exam, and you can ignore the equations and look at the pictures. Okay, so uh, these are just typical examples of the kind of things one wants to use large-scale computing for. On the left is a model of a fuel cell. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later. And the second is an example of a complicated material. This is a sort of a microstructure of lots of bits of gold embedded in a, in a matrix, and you're trying to understand how light propagates when it enters through such a medium. And on the right is a, a design problem of of a radar dish with a very small antenna in the back, which I'll also say more about in a minute. And to do these kinds of calculations, algorithms must be fast and robust. They should be high-order accurate, and they should be precision-dependent, and they should be automatically adaptive. And in some sense, that follows the theme of, of Tsuza's original point, which is that you, know, you can't have a human in the loop when you're writing a program. That everything has to be fully automatic. And that's a recurring theme in all the work uh, that I do. And I think it's something that people don't appreciate so much is that the main feature of these, of these kinds of methods is that they should be easy to use, but it doesn't mean they have to be easy to develop. Okay, so here's a typical example of a large-scale calculation. This is a calculation where these are models of blood cells, and the question is, can we model the flow of enormous numbers of blood cells in a, re in a physically realistic system? So uh, this calculation involved uh, something like 90 billion unknowns, disc discretizing the surface of all those blood cells. There's 200 mi 260 million cells in that simulation, and it was run on a 200,000 core heterogeneous architecture. Uh, another example of a large-scale calculation is electromagnetic interaction with structure. This is, a, this is a cockpit in an airplane. What you see is the pilot seats, you see a computer box, uh, behind the co-pilot in that box is a motherboard, and the question is, if an electromagnetic wave hits that airplane, can you study the excitation induced on the motherboard sitting inside the computer behind the pilot? So it's a very multi-scale problem. This is work from the Bakshi, Yilmaz, Yusel, uh, Hestave, and Jin, and Mickelson. I simply stole their picture, um, and I'll say a little bit about that later on. So let me say a little bit about, about the, about my view, my strange view of the history of scientific computing. Most people don't like it when I say this, so I'm saying this in public. Um, the first thing is that almost all the methods that are used in scientific computing were developed before Moore's Law. There's the algorithms that we typically teach our students in numerical analysis are, were invented sometime between 1900 or 1850 and 1940. They had no idea that supercomputers were coming. And so I would say that many of the existing methods that we use uh, were developed where the dominant view, uh, as, as Hamming said once famously, that the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And I think that we have entered an era where you actually want to compute to get the right answer. That is, you want quantitative precision in a physically complicated environment, and computing now lets us do that. Uh, the bad news is that we don't have an infrastructure for doing that. There's no agreement on standards. And so computing doesn't look like this. So if you look at an engineered system, you know what all the ingredients are. If you want to build a new system, you know what to take off the shelf and build a new system. And scientific computing doesn't work that way because we haven't specified what the parts are. We don't even like to talk about what the parts are. Or I do, but most people don't. Um, we don't state when the, when the algorithms that we use succeed or fail. And uh, that means that we need an infrastructure that will allow us to develop a hierarchy of tools from the sort of simplest modules to the most complicated application-driven ones. Uh, so now we get into the math part of the talk. 
uh, the, the methods that I, my group and I tend to like to work on uh, are, are methods that are based on integral equations, which is, say, Green's functions. I'll say a bit about Green in a minute. I won't, I won't say much about why we do things this way, except to say that these kinds of methods are very well suited to complicated geometries because they don't require uh, very complicated discretizations. You actually take the geometry as input and you solve the problem on the geometry as stated. So that's why I call them data-driven. The, historically, the reason people didn't use integral equation methods is that in the absence of fast algorithms, they're impossible to use. And there are technical issues that I won't talk about, about the fact that when you use integral equation methods, you have very complicated integrals that you have to compute, and that's also complicated. So uh, Green, everyone should know a little bit about, partly because he, he invent invented all the things I like but mostly because he went to third grade and fourth grade and had no formal education after that. So it's rather impressive that he did everything he did with no evidence of any mathematical education. In fact, he grew up, he, he lived in Nottingham. They believe there were a few math books in the local library. They have no idea how it is he became so famous and self-taught. And the paper that he's most famous for was published in the newspaper. It introduced, for those of you who are mathematicians or physicists, or took such courses in college, Green's theorem, Green's functions, Green's identities, and was the first paper that said that the potential function is the right way to think about gravitation. So it was a really good newspaper article, perhaps the best newspaper article ever written. So Green's functions are here. I'm just going to list them. There's a Green's function which describes heat flow, which is a Gaussian, so e to the minus distance squared. There's a, the Green's function of gravitation, which is 1 divided by distance. And there's a the Green's function for wave propagation, which takes this more complicated form of e to the ik distance divided by distance. That's the math lesson. Um, here's an example of, of uh, you, so we saw some, some uh, molecular simulations in a few of the talks earlier today. And the only thing I'm going to say about it is that if you, if you use this kind of a formulation for moving atoms around in a simulation, all of the interactions are local except for the electrostatic interaction, which is the last one. So you see the very last term there has Q divided by R, and R is a very slowly decaying force. All of the other forces are decaying very rapidly, so that's what dominates the computation. So now we have to do a little counting. I, 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 I count a lot. Uh, so let's just look at the cost of computing electrostatic interactions in a big system. So if I build this big matrix here, whose entries are simply the Coulomb or gravitational interaction between a source and a target, it's a dense matrix, and so multiplying a matrix by a vector takes n squared work if there's n entries. That's a, that's a problem. If you want to solve such a system, it takes n cubed operations to do that. So that's, a, that's a, an even more serious problem. And if you look at the scaling, th th this is just a plot on a log log scale of what it means to run at linear, quadratic, or cubic time. And what you see is that it, what it prevents you is not from solving small problems, but it prevents your algorithm from scaling. So if you want to solve a problem with billion, oh, you can't read the axes, but say uh, a million degrees of freedom, it, it is now intractable by any, any standard scheme if you have to do the calculation directly. So at the top is, is, a, is a very simple matrix vector product. So that's the matrix vector product that corresponds to what's called the fast Fourier transform. And simply being able to do that sum quickly is what, is what enabled much modern computing. All of modern signal processing essentially was driven by the fact that it turns out you can do that calculation in n log n operations instead of n squared. Okay, so there's another class of, of fast algorithms which, which uh, is not based on things like the Fourier transform. So here, you're supposed to all know this from high school. So if you have a matrix whose entry is cosine of target minus source, and you remember the addition formula for cosine, then you can write the, that matrix as cosine times cosine plus sine times sine, and simply collect two terms. You compute what in physics would be called moments. So you compute these two numbers. And then once you've computed those two numbers, you get the answer at any target point in two operations. So it, used, it looked like, in the original form, that it would take n squared operations to do it. But if you carry out the, the calculation this way, the cost becomes n. I'm going to skip, uh, for the sake of time, doing this in, in every context, but I'll say a little bit about uh, n-body interactions, since we heard a bunch of astrophysics talks. 
Um, so if you look at the interaction that's one over distance as, as the kernel, then if you have n sources in a sphere and n targets in another sphere, and you have to compute all the interactions directly, it takes n times m operations. There's a, you won't, it, there is a uh, very well-developed theory for approximating such interactions, which was developed in the 19th century, which goes by the name of a multipole expansion. So it simply says, forget the math, that there's a way of representing the field induced by a large number of sources outside the sphere that contains them in a way that makes computation efficient. And what it says is, I can, with approximation, this is not an exact calculation anymore, but with a tolerance that's under my control, I can do linear time work instead of quadratic time work, even to compute those kinds of interactions. The algorithms are a little, are a little complicated because they're hierarchical, and I'm going to, in uh, about 30 seconds, march through the sort of intuition of what underlies these algorithms without any, any uh, formal statements about complexity. But the intuition is, is this, that if you have a lot of sources here and a lot of targets over there, you shouldn't compute all of their detailed interactions. Just like when you want to compute the gravitational force of the moon on the Earth or vice versa, you don't do the calculation at an atomic level. You compute sort of the net mass of the moon and see what it does. And that's essentially the, inter the intuition underlying these methods. So what you do is you simply divide up space hierarchically. So if you concentrate on this light gray box, which is in the center of, that, of the nine white ones, it's well separated from all of the red ones in the sense of this sources are far from the target's idea. And there's the same picture in 3D. So you compute those interactions approximately using these kinds of ideas, and then you simply sweep through space. So you go to a finer scale, repeat the calculation at that scale, go to a finer scale, all the way down until you've reached the finest level. And at the finest level, you compute interactions with your neighbors directly, and you've done the calculation. OK, so that's, that's, that's it for le math lessons. Um, what these algorithms are good for is ubiquitous because these force laws are ubiquitous. Gravitation is everywhere. Electrostatics is everywhere. The same interaction comes up in fluid flow, uh, in, in magnetostatics, in elasticity. So here's simply an example of a group that, that, de that developed a fast multiple-based code for doing molecular interactions. And the question is, can you, can you steer the interaction between a, a protein and its ligand, in this case, acetylcholinesterase and uh, fasciculin, which is a neurotoxin that binds to, to that enzyme? And so with these algorithms, you can do these kinds of calculations with fairly complicated molecular descriptions involving hundreds of thousands of triangles in only 30 seconds on a, on a workstation. So here's a, simply a bigger uh, picture of the fuel cell I showed earlier. So this is a structure which has 9,000 small holes drilled in the side. And just describing the geometry requires about a half a million degrees of freedom. You haven't discretized space at all. Just the geometry itself is that complicated. And again, you can do these kinds of simulations on a desktop. And again, if you can see why this is such a multi-scale problem, um, in, the, in the picture on the left, what you see is a very small antenna and, and a blow-up and a blow-up of those structures. And you can sort of make out that there's a triangulation on that. So there's an enormous number of degrees of freedom at many spatial length scales that are required to do these simulations not just correctly, but automatically. OK, so this is true in the chip industry. So there's, there's a lot. Chips are typically built out of small components. The behavior of all those small components can be done by doing the measurement or by doing the simulation. And we've now reached a point where it's possible to do those simulations uh, accurately and quickly and automatically. And this is a calculation that was done by um, Sharad Kapoor and David Long, who are the Integrant Software. So um, the other thing that you want in a design tool is not only the ability to do the simulation once, but the, the ability to do the simulation many times with, with many different incident fields. So again, for, for those who, who are mathematicians in the audience, it's the difference between solving a problem iteratively and solving it directly. If you, if, if you have to solve the problem iteratively, every time you see a new excitation or a new source, you have to solve the problem again. There's a new class of methods which go by the name of fast direct solvers, which allow you to do multiple excitations simultaneously. And um, 
accurately and very quickly. So this is a calculation which is hundreds of wavelengths in size, which you can solve in 10 seconds on a laptop once you've done a pre-computation that takes some number of minutes. So the, the other kind of, of class of problems that one wants to study with, with these algorithms is electromagnetic scattering. This is simply a picture of, what, of an ESA satellite, and you're, you're interested in how it behaves in, in response to incoming radiation. So these are relatively complicated objects. They're complicated because they have holes in them, which makes them have complicated topology. There's many triangles that, de that, that describe the surface. You need a lot of degrees of freedom. And the question is, can you develop mathematical approaches that are both fast, high order, and have guaranteed accuracy for doing these kinds of, of calculations? So here's this, this is my last example, actually. So in, uh, this is a medical imaging example, and it's just an, an indication of where computational physics intersects with medicine. Um, so it, 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 on the upper left is a picture of a fairly normal hip. However, if that was not a normal hip, it would get replaced. When it gets replaced, you have to insert some hardware into the hip. One of the, one of the pieces of that hardware is a titanium rod. And now when you put someone in an MR machine, it distorts the image. So one of the problems with hip imaging is that once you have an artificial hip, they can no longer image the hip to find out, is that hip going to fail? So artificial hips have a finite lifetime on the order of 10 years, and it would be very nice to know if that hip is about to break. That is, the connection between the bone and the metal is now brittle. Those calculations are, uh, sorry, that imaging process is not possible now because the hip itself interferes with the, the imaging device. So it would be nice if you had algorithms that would allow you to evaluate the perturbation introduced by that hip while doing the imaging process. So you would like to build a complicated electromagnetic modeling capabilities into the MR imaging device so that you can image things even when there are metal, uh, not, not when there's metal that's in, in the patient that's in the, in the machine. So I'm now, now I just have to, uh, I'm going to summarize and, and proselytize. Um, so the, the good news is the first bullet, which is there's been a lot of development in fast algorithms over the last few decades. Um, for almost all of the, of the equations that come up in classical physics, from electrostatics to electromagnetics, diffusion, fluid dynamics, and so on, that we, we can actually break up the computational tasks into pieces and start introducing standards for interfaces of such codes. And what we hope is that, that that will allow rapid development of application layers, which has been one of the big obstacles in scientific computing, is that every time you see a new application, you have to start the code from scratch. There's remarkably few high-level tools that are interchangeable. And finally, that there's still an enormous amount of work to do, and so a lot of the computers that we heard about also today are going to be necessary, because if we want to design by simulation, even with the fast computers that we have now, it's still not fast enough to actually put it in, inside the design process and solve those problems. So there's an enormous amount of work to do, both mathematically and software and in terms of the engineering, to get all these systems to work together. And I will stop there. I will just list uh, all of my collaborators who have done all the hard work. Thank you.